production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. And PNC, committed to Central Ohio, for the achiever in you. This time on Broad and High. Explore the work of 21st century photographers who still use 19th century processes. A lot of um, people who are not photographers don't understand why would you choose to do something that's so labor intensive. And for some of these artists, that's precisely why they want to do it. And meet two Columbus men who want to help you put your best foot forward with their stylish socks. This and more right now on Broad and High. Hi everyone, I'm Kate Quickle and welcome to Broad and High. It's funny to think how photography is still a relatively young art form, not quite 200 years old yet. And despite our millennial love of Instagram and Snapchat filters, the fundamentals of capturing images remain the same. And some contemporary photographers have tossed aside their iPhones and one-click cameras in favor of doing it old school. We learn more about the evolution of the photographic process with a recent visit to the Decorative Arts Center of Ohio in Lancaster. We had to do this exhibit. <laughs> it's our first exhibition of photography and the processes that are used in these images came to peak use during the Civil War. And one of the great generals of the Civil War was born in the house next door, William Tecumseh Sherman. I'm doing a lot of things with the exhibition. I'm not teaching people about photography, but I'm showing people a variety of methods of producing photographs. So photographs do a couple of things. One is that they give you an image of a person or a place or a thing. And within that, they're a time capsule. So they will show you a style of clothing. They'll show you a style of transportation. But then if you look at the imagery more closely, you start to denote class systems or you denote uh, conditions. Uh, I was asked to find contemporary artists working with the techniques that were presented in Scott's half of the exhibition, um, people who are still working with these 170-year-old techniques. Uh, behind me is a, a piece, even though it's 27 separate um, objects, uh, but it's, it's thought of as a piece by an artist named Kelly Anderson Staley. Um, these are collodion on metal, uh, more commonly known as a tintype. She's mostly known for her portrait photography, and I fell in love with her abstractions. Um, and she put this together, um, we worked on it over the course of the summer, she shipped it out, and she's a resident of Houston. And uh, the, the days that we were installing this, her house was consumed and she put her children on a raft and escaped to a friend's house with her husband. Um, and so this work, which she titled at the time, Flood Tide, uh, prophetically, has become uh, uh, something positive in her life because it's hanging here and being enjoyed by everyone while she's dealing with rebuilding her life in, in Houston. A lot of um, people who are not photographers don't understand why would you choose to do something that's so labor intensive. And for some of these artists, that's precisely why they want to do it. Because it is different from digital technologies in that they're making an object. Not pressing a button, not sitting at a computer, but they're making something with their hands and they're making something that's coded, they're making something that they can hold. And it's also something that's unique. Yeah, so why don't you have a seat? So uh, what I have installed here is a project I've been calling the operating room, uh, which is uh, this very uh, 16 by 20 large format camera that I constructed out of um, some old uh, darkroom equipment and a doctor's exam table. And there's a bed frame in there too. Um, 
And this uh, chair I constructed also is out of sort of found materials um, that has a head restraint, uh, much like you might find in a 19th century studio. The name of the operating room comes from um, doing some research on 19th century photography. Oftentimes, uh, photographers were called camera operators, hence their studio would be called an operating room. And I kind of found that really fascinating um, and kind of used that to kind of um, to riff on, I guess. One nice thing about this process, uh, though it is slower than we're used to, you can see results relatively quickly um, within, you know, 15, 20 minutes. Um, if I, you know, go and process it right away, you can see the results fairly fast. Um, it's kind of like shooting a 19th century Polaroid or something that you're manually processing because the plate um, that you get at the end is what was in the camera, just like a Polaroid. I think kind of what my part of this exhibit uh, kind of makes it all real, I think, uh, perhaps to a viewer. Um, it's an, an opportunity to kind of see how some of these images were made, both um, work on the contemporary side and on the 19th century side of the exhibit. Well, I would hope people would, would recognize that um, the history of photography is rich artistically, but to find out that photographers are still using those techniques to say something about their lives today, um, and that that's still a viable thing to do. In our own image, the genesis of photography in the contemporary eye is on view in Lancaster through December 31st. Visit the Decorative Arts Center of Ohio's webpage for details. Next up, two local men want to help you put your best foot forward. They are the founders of Keep It Simple Socks, a Columbus-based subscription service for fashionable footwear. So the idea for Keep It Simple Socks generated um, back in January of 2016. Um, so I was standing around just kind of with a group of friends and. I've always loved cool socks, you know, it's kind of been my thing. Um, so I was trying to explain to them, you know, you just got to kiss your socks, like keep it simple, stupid. Uh, and my friend Zach just kind of yells out of nowhere, no, you got to keep simple socks. Michael came to me, um, I remember a specific night in April, we were hanging out, and he had told me the idea for it months ago when it was just kind of a, an idea that wasn't real, but he told me that he was really going to start it. And so immediately I loved it because I love socks. Um, for the last year, I. We, I got weirdly addicted to socks. I asked socks for, for socks for Christmas for my mom, and she's like, what? So yeah, we decided to do some research and really you know, kind of dig into what you know, designing and manufacturing and that type of thing would look like, e-commerce, um, and then we launched in November of that year. So we kind of have three facets to our business model. Um, so the first would be individual orders. So you can go on the website, you can purchase a single pair of socks, you can purchase you know, a couple of pairs, whatever you want to do. Um, we have then the subscription service, which has essentially three tiers. So you can do a single pair, two pairs, or three pair subscription. So we have some customers that they just want to overhaul their sock drawer. So they get three pairs a month. They've been doing it since we launched. I mean, it's, they have a ton of socks by now. People really enjoy the subscription and really enjoy kind of getting that, you know, getting that a product every month from us and kind of seeing um, and seeing where we're going as we release new designs and seeing how our brand is kind of moving forward too. So that's kind of the, off the e-commerce, that's the e-commerce piece of it. And then our, our third kind of facet is our wholesale. We go to a lot of local events, kind of the made local marketplaces or Ohio made uh, marketplaces, we do a lot of those. So all the design work is done here, um, local, obviously by us in-house. And then what is not produced here is the actual sock. So we have a manufacturer overseas. It's made out of 8% cotton, and then it's got some polyester in there, um, but also has elastane, which helps it to stretch a little bit. So the reason for that is because they can fit anywhere from, we have a lot of female subscribers, which is really cool. Um, so it fits you know, some slightly smaller feet up to you know, size 12, 13. It can stretch without you know, damaging the material or design or anything. We don't do any packaging overseas, you know, we package them all here. Um, we like to put individual notes in every, you know, in your first subscription. Um, so it just kind of gives more of a personal touch, I suppose. 
We really decided we want to do one thing, do it really, really well. And if we get to a point to where we can expand, we will expand even to outside of maybe socks. And as we grow and grow, if um, we get to a point, our, our, um, we would love to be able to start our own manufacturing and have our own, do it all in-house, which would be really, really cool. So that's kind of where our eye is on in the near future. But we're really excited for the new designs that are coming out this fall. They're going to be awesome. Um, just a little sneak peek, we actually have an 80s line coming out, so that's going to be really, really awesome. Visit KeepItSimpleSocks.com to learn more about this Columbus-based subscription sock service. They're on Instagram, too. Price Hill is one of the oldest communities in Cincinnati, and in recent years, several community groups have been working hard to revitalize the neighborhood. One of its shining examples of civic participation is a program called Music for Youth in Cincinnati, or My Cincinnati. It was inspired by El Sistema, Venezuela's revolutionary youth orchestra program that uses music as a vehicle for social change. But closer to home in our sister city to the south, My Cincinnati aims to make classical music a unifying force for residents to connect over their shared humanity. What does the 21st century artist look like? It's a great question. I think the old model of conservatory training, which is try to get really good at your instrument and hope you get a job in an orchestra, that is already dead and gone. It was difficult. It is even more difficult now. Some might say impossible. So if you're looking from a purely career-oriented perspective, that model of musicianship, of professional musicianship, doesn't make sense. So you need to branch out. You need to make yourself more accessible. You need to make yourself more able to connect with diverse communities communities with different needs, artistic, social needs, and you have to be able to work with people, and you have to be able to work together. Hi, my name is Eddie Kwan. I'm the director of My Cincinnati. My Cincinnati is a free daily youth orchestra program for children in Price Hill. Price Hill has historically been a working class community. It's an interesting time to be in Price Hill as part of the My Cincinnati community because Price Hill is going through some pretty significant changes. And we have a unique vantage point as artists in the neighborhood and as musicians in the neighborhood and as teaching artists that are working with children to be a unifying force uh, for the community and to be an opportunity for folks in the neighborhood to come together to connect over their shared humanity and to work together towards a common goal, which hopefully and should align with the goals of the residents. So a majority of our students at My Cincinnati are young people of color, many of whom come from immigrant families. So while all experiences are varied and different and nuanced in very, very important ways, I found that my background as a child of immigrants and as a person of color allowed me uh, unique opportunities and, and paths to connect with my students in important ways. I am beyond grateful for my time here. It's difficult to imagine what I would be like and what my life would be like without my Cincinnati. So My Cincinnati has around 100 students, a little over 100 students enrolled. The vast majority of those students are coming uh, to orchestra every single day. So if you were to walk into our program building at peak hour, you would see 
you know, at least two orchestras rehearsing downstairs, all of the practice rooms filled with private lessons happening or mini sections. Upstairs, you would see uh, another orchestra performing in one room. You would see a sectional happening in the hallway. You'd see another sectional happening in the conference room. You'd see some mini lessons happening in the back corner room. You see the winds happening uh, in another room. So really, when you come in, there's just this unstoppable and fluid movement of music happening at all times. I like that it's somewhere safe that I could come to after school, like without being judged by anybody else. And also, it's free. I like at school, I have to pay for lessons. And, but here it's mostly free. It taught me how to be a leader, how to lead and how to picture yourself as a teacher and as a student to see both sides of the spectrum. Like a lot of the younger kids, I think some of them are getting the idea that music is a very powerful tool and some of them it takes time. I think some of them are getting that, that idea that music is powerful enough to spark a change. The adult orchestra is one of my favorite new additions to My Cincinnati. The adult orchestra is led by Laura Jekyll, who was the founder of My Cincinnati, and it came, uh, it came about pretty organically. The only qualification is uh, you live in the neighborhood. Otherwise, just like My Cincinnati, it is a completely free program and we provide all of the instruments. So right now, uh, Laura's orchestra has around 35 adults, some of whom are My Cincinnati parents, which is very cool, but mostly just uh, neighborhood residents. The kids are, at this point, definitely better than the, the adults. Laura will sometimes ask some of the older my Cincinnati students that have parents in the orchestra to help out, to demonstrate, to model good position, uh, to play along. So that's a really cool opportunity so the kids have a chance to be the teachers. I think one of the most profoundly beautiful things about music and the kind of music that we're playing here is that music has its own set of rules and expectations. And when you're playing a piece of music, you are in fact stepping into a world that has its own laws, that has its own culture, that has its own traditions. And this set of laws is completely removed from our own, which means that you have to expand your imagination enough, you have to be creative enough to commit to being in this alternate reality, which is what it is. And when you do that enough, all right, one more time, you are then given the kinds of tools that are required to make that subtle shift in your thinking. First note should be like a bomb, boom, ready? What can be different about my life? What more can I imagine for myself and for my family and for my community, for my school? So in order to do something expressive, you need to use a particular kind of technique. What music does is that it presents you with that opportunity to ask that question, and then it gives you concrete steps to get there. Learn more about this free youth orchestra program in the Price Hill neighborhood of Cincinnati by visiting mycincinnatiorchestra.org. Calabasa. It's a fancy word for gourd, and decorating gourds, mostly through wood burning, is an ancient tradition across Africa, Asia, and the Americas dating back thousands of years. Calabasas are still used as canvases today, and our next story follows one artist whose work is influenced by the vast beauty of her desert surroundings, as well as her Navajo and Aztec heritage. My name is Tia Flores and I do pyrographic uh, gourd sculptures or calabasa sculptures. Calabasa art is actually, it's a fancy name for gourd. I use gourds as my canvas and from that I do wood burning on it, which is also known as pyography. 
Pyrography is an ancient art form of drawing or writing with fire. And there are different types of hot tools that you can use to burn on a particular surface. And because the hard shell gourd is very much like a, the surface of a wood, it takes really, really well to wood burning or the pyrography. The gourd is one of those natural organic units that's been found on nearly every continent around the world. It's been used by every culture in the world. In fact, it predates pottery. In some countries it was used for ceremonial purposes. That's what the Native Americans use it for. I started working with gourds in the, in the 90s, the late 90s. Uh, I was going through sort of a transition in my life, a career transition trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. And, uh, and I also wanted to get in touch with my heritage. The pieces that I create and design, they're a reflection of my family history. I'm a fourth generation of Aden, And so from my mom's side of the family, they were settlers that came across very stoic, hard Nevadans, you know, worked in the mines and stuff. And then on my dad's side of the family, uh, that's the Aztec and Navajo, and uh, my grandma was a healer. So a lot of my work reflects either side of the family. They're either, it's a, you know, Navajo uh, teachings on that, or Aztec symbolism, or something that's reflective of the Nevada desert, uh, or the Great Basin. Growing up in Nevada, I've always been drawn to the, the creatures and the animals and the habitat, and I love the symbolism and the the vast beauty of the desert, and I try to reflect that in a lot of my pieces. I've always been fascinated with snakes and the, the pattern and the texture and just the beauty of that snake. In Navajo, the butterfly represents transformation, that we're always growing and evolving into something you know, more beautiful. If you take a look at the tortoise, the tortoise shell represents the birth of earth and it represents mother nature. So you're putting beautiful images on there but at the same time you're able to tell a story and, and a meaning behind it. I like to surround myself with the gourds in my studio. Let's say I find the perfect gourd. Sometimes I'll look at it and I'll see something come out of it. There's an image that needs to be put on it. Then I clean it and it's got a nice smooth smooth surface that's really conducive to the wood burning on it and I sketch out my designs on it. And then once I sketch it, then I start to burn it, and just lightly burning it, just to give it a light touch and to see how it goes. When I'm making my art, there's nothing that separates me from the gourd because I'm, I have to hold it, I have to cradle it the whole time I'm working on it. There's just this nice connection. You almost go into a different state. As you're burning it, the smell almost reminds you of sitting around a campfire. It's very meditative and very relaxing. Your mind can go off into different corners, especially when you're sitting around, you're embracing the gourd, and there's just that, that earthy connection that I just love to work with. That's our show. We want to give a shout out to the Cultural Arts Center for letting us take over their beautiful pottery workshop today. Remember, you can revisit all of our stories online at WOSU.org and on the WOSU Public Media mobile app. Be sure to give us a follow on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram as well. We're closing out today's show with music by the Columbus-based band known as Harvest Kings. Thanks for watching. Be sure to join us back here next week with more great stories on Broad and High. I am um, originally from Toledo, Ohio. My family is from Detroit. Um, and then we all kind of migrated down here when I went to uh, Columbus College of Art and Design. I remember being younger and like not really seeing myself in places. 
Like when I was younger, I couldn't find paper dolls that look were that were brown, you know? <laughs> like I couldn't, so I made my own. And I did that as like a six year old little girl. I made my own paper dolls and it, it grew to like a collection of like a thousand paper dolls because that's how dedicated I was or passionate about seeing things that look like me in the world, you know. So with my work I I want to show like people of color, black people doing regular things, you know what I mean, existing in their regular life and being happy or being sad or being playful or being in love, like that's all very important to me to just illustrate those, those moments because you don't see them as much as you should, you know. I think it was in 2012 is kind of when I figured out that I can actually sell my artwork on products and that's when Ariel Brands came about. I basically took my artwork and started putting on everything that I could think of, like literally printing it on everything <laughs> I can think of. Back before, you know, when I was younger, when I was a kid, like that, we didn't, I didn't have access to seeing like a black artist, a black woman artist creating artwork and making money off of it and actually having her own studio and stuff like that. Like I didn't know they existed. <laughs> And so being able to fill that gap feels great for me because I know like the next generation, they'll have more examples that I didn't have when I was younger. Catch Columbus at its creative best on Broad and High, Thursday nights at eight o'clock on WOSU-TV. Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. And PNC, committed to Central Ohio, for the achiever in you.